To spoil the conclusion of this video just a little bit, I actually do think that the S5 Mark II is a better video camera than the A7 IV. I rented the Panasonic Lumix S5 Mark II for a little bit over a week and I actually took it back yesterday so I don't have it to make this video, which is stupid. Regardless, I wanted to give you my thoughts and opinions about which is better for video, the S5 Mark II or the Sony a7 IV. When they announced the specs of the S5 II, I did kind of a paper rundown between the two cameras and on paper, specs wise, the S5 Mark II has a lot of additional features that you don't get in the Sony cameras and it looks like it's probably a better buy. So I wanted to see how it stacks up in reality. So let me contextualize and add a couple of details really quick before we get into the comparisons. I shot zero photos with the SI Mark II. I think that the whole hybrid component of this debate is important or it is potentially important. So if you, if you need to know anything about photography and how it actually stacks up as a hybrid camera against the A7 IV, then you'll have to check out some other videos or do some additional research. Secondly, I only rented one lens with the S5 II. I got the Panasonic uh, 35 millimeter F1.8. So all the comparisons that I did with the Sony a 7 IV, I used the Sony 35 millimeter F1.8. This is just regular stabe on the Panasonic. In conjunction with rolling shutter on cameras like this, these little hybrid cameras, if they have bad rolling shutter, and they have bad IBIS, then it's kind of a double whammy in terms of trying to utilize it as a video camera, especially as a handheld kind of run and gun style video camera. And that's pretty much the scenarios that I compared the two cameras in. Let's look at the rolling shutter performance. So I'm gonna do a classic YouTube whip pan and I put the SI Mark II on the tripod and then I stuck the Sony on top of the SI Mark II. So the panning is exactly the same on both cameras. As you can see, neither camera does a really great job in this comparison. They both have really slow, slow reading sensors, which results in some pretty bad rolling shutter artifacts. The a7 IV seems to be even a little bit worse than the S5 Mark II, but the S5 Mark II isn't that great either. A lot of people on YouTube will basically end the comparison right there and just tell you that, yeah, if you want to do fast whip pans or you want to stick the camera on a tripod and film things moving quickly across the frame, then that's where you're going to see the rolling shutter but that's only part of the story. The rolling shutter also comes into play when you're trying to get handheld shots. Even if you're not trying to pan quickly, if you just wanna stand and try to follow some action, then you also will potentially have some problems with the rolling shutter because in the a7 IV, the IBIS isn't really that great. Just trying to stand and follow some action, if you're not super deliberate and careful, you can easily introduce some pretty bad shocks and wobbles and judders, whatever you want to call them, into the footage on the a7 IV. Whereas on the S5 Mark II, it takes a lot more to get the footage to really be noticeably like jerky, jittery, and I don't know, to the extent that you see on the a7 IV very easily. Here's a more direct comparison of just what the IBIS is like doing a careful, trying to be careful with the cameras and walking forward. So I've got two comparisons here. So here's with the standard IBIS on the a7 IV. And here's with the standard IBIS on the SI Mark II. And now here is the active mode on the a7 IV, which introduces about a 10% crop. And now here is the boost mode on the S5 Mark II, which is the electronic stabilization on top of the in-body image stabilization. Obviously I didn't get the S5 II plus boost at the same location, but aside from that incongruity, I don't think the boost really adds anything for a moving shot on the Panny, whereas it helps tremendously on the Sony. There are some things that you can do to mitigate that poor performance that you get with the A7 IV. You can 
use the active stabilization, the cost of the crop, obviously. You can put a cage on it, a top handle, try to make it a little bit heavier so that you can get rid of a lot of that micro jitter that you might have. You can also do some post stabilization. So Sony's has Catalyst Browse, which is a free software that you can use to add stabilization. Catalyst Browse does have some downsides. A, the Catalyst Browse is free, but you don't have really any control over the parameters of the stabilization. It's basically just an on or off. And you can see just how much is gonna crop into this footage in order to get a stabilized results. Secondly, you should shoot at a faster shutter speed than you might want to. That actually worked out for the shots that I'm using here. I actually shot at a 90 degree shutter because I wanted to emphasize like the fast movements and make it seem more like an action shoot, I guess. But if you wanted to shoot at 180 degrees or at 24 frames per second, that would be 1 50th. Catalyst Browse is not gonna work as well as it does when you shoot at a faster shutter. You can also try to use post stabilization in whatever software, whatever editing software you're using. I'll just go ahead and throw it on here and you can see just how bad of a job it's gonna do. So it's gonna take a lot of work in order for you to dial in those settings in order to get an acceptable results. Going back to the S5 Mark II, so not only is the stabilization a lot better if you just wanted to stand and follow action, but as you can see in a couple shots here, I'm actually able to walk with the camera. And it, in my opinion, it looks pretty convincing. It looks really good, almost as if you have a big cinema camera or maybe an ENG style camera on your shoulder. That's something that you just can't do with the Sony a 7 There is the potential of having some wobbly corners because the stabilization is so good if you shoot on a wide angle lens. And I don't know what the cutoff is, but I would suspect that probably 20 millimeters and wider is when you, you might start introducing some of that wobbling corner artifact with the stabilization on the Panasonic. There's definitely trade-offs and you'll never get the wobbly corners with Sony regardless of the focal length because the stabilization just isn't that strong no matter what you do. 51,200. Let's take a look at the high ISO performance or low lights. I shot this a couple of different times. The first time the power was out in our house, so actually didn't have any lights. So I just was using some flashlights and some candles. And I think I misfocused pretty, pretty bad on both cameras. I think I finally did get it on the S5 Mark II but that doesn't really matter. Just pay attention to the noise performance. I'm not including every ISO across the range on either camera, just sort of skipping around from low to high, just so you can get a, an idea of how both react to noise or how both deal with noise. A couple things to note about this. So I'm using V-Log on the Panasonic and S-Log3 on the Sony. Secondly, the S5 II has control over the noise reduction. You can go into the menu and dial it from negative two, I believe is the minimum, all the way up to plus 10. And by default, if you shoot in V-Log, it's set to negative two. So in this first set of comparisons, I have the Panasonic set to negative two. Obviously it's gonna be much more noisy than the Sony. As I mentioned, the Panasonic allows you to add or subtract noise reduction. So in the second round of tests, I am still shooting in V-Log, but I added plus five noise reduction, and I just chose plus five sort of arbitrarily. This brings it much more in line with what you're getting from the Sony, so the noise is much reduced. It's also a lot more monochromatic, and in my opinion, they look very similar. Even though I think the S5 Mark II overall is a better video camera, the Sony still has some significant advantages, and one of them is in autofocus. I shot an entire YouTube video with the Panasonic as my main camera. It worked flawlessly. It was a microphone comparison, so there was potential for the camera and the lens to get distracted, but it never did, so it stayed locked onto my face. They both have a setting that's essentially it says locked on. So you, you have a subject, whether that's like a human with eye tracking enabled, or maybe an animal with animal eye detect, et cetera. If you have that subject in the frame and it's found that subject and you can tell that it's following them, if you have it set to locked on, then theoretically, regardless of what else happens, whatever moves across the frame, the camera shouldn't immediately move to that other subject. Sony does a really, really good job of that. You have to, you have to be very persistent <laughs> with putting something in front of the camera to make it forget and want to, to leave the original subject. 
the Panasonic is much more apt to forget the, the first subject and move to something that comes in front of, of the frame. That's one area where the Panasonic definitely lags the Sony. But the other thing that it definitely didn't do as well is in touch tracking. So they both have the ability to basically tap on something in the frame and a little box will appear. And then in theory, again, it should follow that thing around the frame. That's another area where Sony does really well. It's essentially rock solid. And if you touch on something, it is gonna stay latched onto that subject unless something comes in front of it and just stays and blocks it. On the Panasonic, it really had a hard time really latching on to anything. So there's a lot of fast moving things, a lot of people moving around the frame, but it didn't seem like it really had much chance or really any ability to stay latched on to any one particular person. And oftentimes the little tracking box would just stop following moving action at all and then just go right to the background. Those are those are the usual breaking I'm not going to talk too much about image quality or color science. Color science, on the one hand, is very subjective. It's so easy to change. So both of these cameras have 422 10-bit profiles in camera. So you have so much latitude, leeway, ability to manipulate the footage. If you don't want to do all that, then the images that are coming right out of camera are good. In my opinion, the V-Log is a little bit reddish in terms of the way it renders skin tones. It also had a tendency to sort of highlight some blemishes that I was uh, ha that I had at the time that I shot that footage. In the video that I shot with the S5 Mark II, the little microphone comparison, I used the A7IV as the B cam, and it was very easy for me to match up the cameras. Color science, whatever. In terms of just overall image quality, it's also a big whatever. They're both extremely, extremely similar. I definitely focused on a different spot because I suck at making videos. You're getting a 33 megapixel or 7K down sample into 4K on the a7 IV. And on the S5 Mark II, you're getting a 24 or thereabouts megapixel or 6K down sample into 4K. But you can also shoot in 6K. This is 6K 420 10-bit and 5.9K. Now this is the 5.9K, 24 frames, 420, 10-bit. So you could potentially have more detail, but you also have the ability to punch in a little bit more if you want to output into 4K. I can't really see any differences. My main monitor is only 1440p, so whatever differences there is between 4K and 6K are basically lost in the monitor resolution anyway. Dynamic range on both cameras is fantastic. The footage that I shot on that first day out in the field with the Bellagarth Warriors was really bright. It was also really backlit as the sun went down and I manipulated the footage quite a bit. There's a ton of latitude in both of these cameras to adjust your exposure. I mean, you can't obviously rescue completely blown out highlights, but as long as you didn't lose the highlights in camera, you can boost the shadows quite a bit. You can bring the highlights down. You can do whatever you want to do. Image quality, again, it's a wash. They're both really good. Oh, this fucking shutter, man. There are some negatives with the S5 Mark II. Let me get into that real quick. So one big thing that I disliked about the body of the camera is that the shutter dial is way too easy to accidentally rotate. And you can see some footage there <laughs> where I am uh, unbeknownst to me. Uh, changing my exposure by accidentally rotating the shutter dial. The next negative is stuck pixels. You can see in that first ISO test that I did, at some point as I go up the ISO range, there is a stuck pixel that just pops up on the S5 Mark II footage. I don't know how prevalent a problem this is, but I've already seen another YouTuber who has the S5 Mark II essentially run into the same problem where he's already gotten some stuck pixels after having the camera for just a few days or a few weeks. And that appeared for me only after a few days of using the camera. So there is a pixel remapping or sensor recalibration feature on the camera, and that seemed to take care of the issue, but it's not gonna retroactively fix the footage that already has a stuck pixel on it. That problem theoretically could happen to any camera, and I think that most cameras these days do have a pixel recalibration or sensor recalibration feature in them, but I've never had that problem on any Sony camera that I've owned. 
In the previous video that I did, the specs comparison between the two cameras, I did outline or basically list off all of the extra features that the S5 Mark II has for video shooters that the Sonys don't have. So I don't wanna go over all of that again, but I wanna talk about one additional feature that I found really cool in the S5 Mark II. And that has to do with the ability to control how the lenses behave. The Panasonic allows you to choose in the menu whether you want it to be acceleration-based or linear. On Sony, it basically just comes down to the lens itself. Some are acceleration-based, some are linear. It seems like Sony has moved all of its lenses over to linear in the past couple years, but if you have some older Sony lenses, chances are they'll be acceleration-based. If you have Sigma and Tamron lenses, most of them tend to be acceleration-based, although it seems like Sigma maybe is going towards linear now, but I don't know. <laughs> Not only that, if you have it on manual focus, you can, choose how far you want the focus throw to be from minimum focus or close focus distance to infinity. So if you want it to be like just a really short, maybe 90 degree turn to go from minimum to infinity, you can do that. If you want it to be a much longer, precise, maybe more cinematic focus pull, you can, you can adjust it all the way up to 360 degrees. Sony has no feature like that. Sony does have some advantages. The autofocus, as I mentioned, I think is better. The S5 Mark II only has long GOP or IPB compression internally, so it's a much more compressed file that you get. The Sony has those too, but it also has all intra compression, which is a less compressed file, which potentially gives you better image quality, but I find that in practice, it doesn't really matter too much. But if you do want all eye, then you, you don't have it in the S5 Mark II. It will be in the S5 Mark II X whenever that comes out later this year. All that said, just to summarize, I think the S5 Mark II is a better video camera than the a7 IV. It's about $500 cheaper. It has a lot of features that the Sony doesn't have. And the IBIS is so much better that it makes it a much more viable handheld style camera than the a7 IV. The body is only one consideration. That doesn't mean that I'm selling Sony and switching over to Panasonic because I have lenses, I've got other camera bodies. And that's obviously a consideration when you're trying to choose which camera to go with. If I didn't have anything, if I was starting from scratch, trying to figure out which full frame camera in the $2,500 and under price bracket I wanted to get, I would strongly, strongly, strongly lead, lean to Panasonic. 